Hello and welcome. You're listening to Bay Bay Plastic, a podcast where we rethink how we can deal with plastic waste in the Bay Area. I am Chris from Hong Kong. I'm Naomi from Japan. And I am Pella from the Netherlands. And we are your hosts from Minerva Schools at KGI, an undergraduate program based in San Francisco. In our three-episode series, we delve into plastic recycling, plastic separating, and plastic upcycling, where we interview experts and present our research in the field. Hello, and welcome back to the third episode of Bye Bay Plastic. Today, we will focus on reusing and upcycling as a solution towards zero waste. While reusing means using the same product multiple times, such as grocery shopping with the same tote bag or planting with old plastic bottles, thereby reducing plastic consumption, upcycling might be a less familiar concept to most of you. We can think of upcycling as a subset of reusing. But this time, we reuse plastic that is otherwise waste and create a product that is of higher quality and value. However, this often involves processes that are not tractable on a home level, so we will focus on innovative businesses that upcycle to create their products and how you can be on the lookout for them. Since the passing of the New Jersey's mandatory recycling law in 1984. Modern urban recycling has created a tremendous supply of recycled plastics and other materials. However, the low demand for upcycled products made of these materials is making the economics unsustainable. In a Harvard Business article, David Biddle of the public recycling official of Pennsylvania lays out three myths that people associate with upcycled products: high cost, low quality, and unsteady supply. To achieve a hundred percent circular economy in plastic, not only do businesses have to ensure the same price and quality as their virgin counterparts, but individuals also have to break their own stereotypes towards upcycling. Coming up next, we'll have some fun with Pella on how to reuse plastic products at home. We'll also look at innovative businesses, both big corporates and small startups, that are leading the forefront of plastic upcycling and circular economy. Finally, we'll hear from Morris, the founder of the Library of Things movement in the UK, and how it can be spread in the Bay Area. But first, as usual, what do our peers know about reusing and upcycling? Most Minervans have only been here for less than half a year, so we asked them if they have ever thrifted at a thrift store in San Francisco. Oh、uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes. I haven't done that yet, but I've really been meaning to do so because it just seems like such an effective way of upcycling old materials. I thrift clothes mostly. I thrift plates, cutlery. I love thrifting. Okay, I have nothing thrifted though. But、um, oh mean, no, your, this is your red coat. Oh, my red coat is thrifted. Yeah, that's true. We thrift a lot. I go there like once a week regularly just to check what they have. No, yeah, I did once. Yeah, I bought a spoon. You bought a spoon. Yeah, a spoon at a thrift store. Mm-hmm. I don't because they are not in Egypt. But in a sense, I came to San Francisco. I'm considering going. Second question: Have you ever made something useful out of something you would otherwise throw out? No, no, never. No, not like a cardboard box or something. No, no, no. Or like a, a shoe. Mm-mm. Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, I re- reuse a lot of things that I buy <laughs> because I like crafts. Sometimes I just do artwork with them. Other times, if it's some kind of a container, I just decorate it and use it as a container. I don't know. This is really silly, but like one time I had like a lot of plastic waste I wanted to throw out, and I just gig- just fashioned them into like a gigantic necklace for myself. <laughs> <laughs> no. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> I don't know. What do you mean? Wait, wait, wait. So what? What? what wait, what's the question again? Oh yes, I do. I do. Some, I I put sugar in my tomato jar. All right. Question three: If I say there are shirts that are made out of ocean plastic, would you wear them? I absolutely would. Hundred percent. Ninety-five percent. The other five percent is how fashionable they look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if they're trendy. <laughs> <laughs> sure, if they're the same price as other shirts. Oh no. Yeah, well, is it cute?、That's、Depends on what it looks、efficient. like. If they look nice, yeah. Follow-up question: Would you think that these ocean plastic shirts would be worse than normal shirts made of new materials? If I'm basing completely of a gut reaction, yes. Even if they're not the best quality, just the motivation that at least it's 
a helping the environment could just be enough for me to wear them. Yeah, oh, like please. I'm pretty, I'm pretty fine with sacrificing for these causes. <laughs> but I truly believe <laughs> companies will not produce this kind of T-shirts, for example, if they're not really competitive with usual stuff. So I'm pretty sure if they're gonna exist, they're gonna be in the market. They're probably in very good quality. So yes, I'm gonna buy. At the end of the day, most Minervans said they would wear a shirt made of ocean plastic, which is good to hear. But they also thought that some sacrifice or right motivation is needed to buy them. Does that prove the stereotype that environmentalism comes with the trade-off of lower quality? Anyways, Pele seems to be working on something. Let's see what he's up to. Sinead is a college student in San Francisco. She just had some yogurt with cola on the side. Her bucket of yogurt and the bottle of cola are empty. Then, she puts it in a plastic bag she got from grocery shopping. She walks through the hallway. And to the landfill bin. Sinead, what are you doing? You can reuse that! Why would you reuse this? It's rubbish. I'm gonna throw it out immediately. No, Sinead. Watch me. I'll transform these rubbish into riches. Well, well. So, we're gonna transform this trash into something new. Something useful for people like me. So, I am currently in my room and I have all the materials. Um, let's start. First, I need to remove the print from the yogurt bucket that I have. Um, because I don't want it to say bio-organic dairy-free yogurt, however nice that sounds. Um, I found a tip on the internet saying that I have to use nail polish remover, and that should do the trick. So Pella went to visit his friend Macbeth, famous for her nail designs she does on other students, to get some nail polish remover. Hey Macbeth, how are you doing? I'm good, Pele. How are you? I'm fine. Um, can I ask you for a favor? Yeah, sure. What do you need? Um, can I borrow your nail polish remover for an evening? Um, what do you want to use it for? Uh, well, long story, but I have to fulfill my civic responsibility. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. You can have it, but I need it by today evening, and you should definitely come for a manicure later in the week. Okay. I promise you I'll drop by. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anytime. I'm back in my room. I got the nail polish remover. So now we have everything we need. We have a yogurt bucket, I have a plastic bottle, I have plastic bags, and I have nail polish remover. Um, and we can start. So I'm gonna try scratching this paint off. Macbeth told me I should scratch first and then apply the nail polish remover. So the paint is coming off, but it's not like it's like it's disappearing completely. Uh, the first shot or something. Let's use some of this nail polish remover. What a such an interesting bottle. Hmm. So it does seem like the nail polish remover takes away some paint, but it mainly sort of makes it vague. Well, I guess I'll be scratching for a while. I am honestly curious to see what Pele is going to craft out of a yogurt bucket, cola bottle, and plastic bags. Anyways, back to serious stuff. We have to admit that plastic has had bad press and an even worse reputation with the ocean. Currently, 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic are drifting in the Great Pacific Garbage Batch, with an area twice the size of Texas. Plastic is found not just in the guts of marine organisms, but even in humans through the seafood we consume. This makes you ask, what can we do about it? In this section, we first turn to companies in the fashion industry and then the food packaging industry, exploring how they respond to a plastic crisis. According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, 60% of all materials used by the fashion industry are made from some form of plastic, polyester, lycra, and nylon, just to name a few. 
In 2015, sportswear giant Adidas announced that it partnered with environmental organization Parley for the Ocean to make sneakers out of ocean plastic. They began with 7,000 pairs out of the 400 million pairs it manufactured annually and scaled up to 11 million the following year, around 3% of its shoe production. This is great news not only because ocean plastic is fished out, but also because they don't have to go to the landfill and can be used to make fashion products that carry a higher value, the very definition of upcycling. While Adidas is taking lead as a corporate giant, other smaller startups like Loopworks, Cotopaxi, and United by Blue all produce outdoor gears like waterproof jackets, backpacks, and tents out of recycled plastic. A brief rouse on their websites and you'll be convinced of its quality with its relatively inexpensive price and aesthetic marketing designs. While this is an exciting start, we can consider what more needs to be done to reach a fully circular economy. Currently, the sneakers and shirts might upcycle plastic waste, but they also need to be recyclable after use. If the shirts themselves cannot be recycled, they might somehow end up back into the ocean. The problem of plastic pollution would then persist, even though it's slightly better in the sense that no new plastic is generated. Upcycled products being recyclable is only one part of it though. Another part is whether consumers cooperate to recycle them, which is what we delved into in the second episode, which makes the circular economy a mutual responsibility shared between companies and consumers. Therefore, what the sustainable fashion industry calls the holy grail, or the ultimate goal, is to make products biodegradable. This means that we don't need to rely on consumers to complete the loop in the circular economy of plastic. Whether they decide to recycle or dispose them, they will end up breaking down naturally. This is also Adidas' long-term goal for beyond 2030, when all their product lines will be made of upcycled and recyclable materials, or even biodegradable materials in the future. Fortunately, the technology of replacing plastic with biodegradable alternatives already exists. In the food packaging industry, NotPla, short for not plastic, produces sauce packets or beverage pods that are made of brown seaweed that has a high growth rate and is biodegradable. The bioplastic does not take 500 years to decompose like mainstream plastic, but breaks down in a matter of 4 to 6 weeks. Logically, they are also edible, which means after drinking the water, you could also eat the quote unquote seaweed bottle. And this is happening for running events and marathons in London already. Other products include plastic films for preserving food in the fridge, and fruit nets, the very nets that strangle sea turtles and other marine organisms. Under the pandemic, the San Francisco government has enforced the use of compostable containers for takeout, and NotPla is one of the major suppliers. Another company manufacturing seaweed-based plastic alternatives is Lollyware, who specializes in making straws for beverages, and particularly boba tea, which is becoming increasingly popular. NotPla and Lollyware's plastic alternatives are exciting solutions because 50% of plastic packaging is single-use and this technology can reduce half of the plastic packaging waste. However, for non-single-use products like plastic boxes or plastic chairs, biodegradables are not ideal as we want these items to remain sturdy for a longer period of time. I mean, you don't want your plastic garden chair crumbling after a few weeks. One possible direction we think this technology can improve towards is the ability to control the time of decomposition. Currently, the technology allows the material to survive in a matter of weeks. If we can chemically engineer bioplastics with predetermined lifetimes, we can apply it more broadly and adjust the desired lifespan of the plastic. If you're interested in companies that upcycle plastic or use biodegradable plastic alternatives, you're welcome to check out our endnotes on the list of companies we compiled. However, because these products are still not widespread, you might not have the chance to buy these products at your location. Perhaps then one thing you can start doing now is to reduce plastic consumption, particularly packaging. Surprisingly, we found that bar soap is an underrated alternative to bottle soap. It might seem obvious at first because it has been around for a long time, but 60% of the weight of bottle soap is actually water. That is not very efficient packaging, as water can just come out of your shower head. Not only does bar soap get rid of plastic packaging, it also has a smaller carbon footprint due to its lighter weight in shipping and storage. Anyways, back to the fun stuff. Let's see what Pella is up to with this DIY reusing project. So, after I've been scratching for about minutes it's still not really all gone so I guess next time I should use a stronger stronger nail polish remover um, but I'm gonna move on I, I'll, I'll just draw on it so that it um, looks nice um, 
And so now what we need to do is I have the, the lid of the cup and I need to cut a hole in it. That's the size of the bottle that I'm first going to cut off. So I'm going to start with the bottle. And so the purpose of this bottle top will be to hold my plant later. And slowly we'll see what this will be. So now that I have the top, I will cut off, make sure that it's a bit nicer at the top because now it's a bit wonky. So now that we have the top of the bottle, we also need to create a hole in the yogurt cap that's about the same size or slightly smaller. So let's just use a knife for that. Now that I have this hole in the top of the yogurt bucket, I can put... Oh, it's still a bit too small. So ideally, I'd want the bottle to sort of fit in so that it only sticks out a little bit upside down. Okay, this looks good. So now I have a yogurt bucket with a hole in the top that I tried cleaning from the outside with the top of a plastic bottle upside down in it. And so now what we need to do is we need to make sure that this entire thing can hang. And to do that, we need rope. So I'm going to try making rope out of the plastic bags that I got from Sinead. To do this, I should make small strips of plastic bag, which I'm going to try doing. Just with my so I'm supposed to tie the ends together, which I will do. I will make a little... And so how you make the rope is you take these two pieces of plastic and one of them you twist for a bit until it sort of curls up. And you roll it around the other and then you twist the other. And you continue doing this until it becomes this sort of chain. So now I have this chain and now I have to attach it somehow to this yogurt bucket. So I'm going to pierce holes in it and see what I can do. Ah, and now I managed to get the other side in as well. So now I have a bucket that I can hang. And I have a bottle, a bottle that can... I have to fit the yogurt cup lid on it and then the bottle fits in there and then the only thing we need to do is put some holes in the cap of the of the bottle then we just fill the bottom of the bucket with water bottle goes upside down in the water in the bucket and I already see the water coming up through the, through the top that is now in the water and then the last step is to transplant my favorite plant into this pot and so now that I transplanted my plant I'm done. And they have a beautiful hanging plant self-watering system. And if you want to make the same, then look at the podcast notes to see how to do it and to see what the result is. So we discussed how you can reduce your waste through changing your consumer behavior. But maybe it would be best not to buy new products at all. Here, we'd like to welcome Morris from the Library of Things in the UK, where you can borrow useful things like drills, unicycles, and carpet cleaners, just like you would borrow books from libraries and use them and return them back once you have finished. Are you ready to be charmed by Morris talking about his life and passion? Let's get straight into it. Hello, Morris. Welcome to the interview. Um, before we go into any questions, could you please introduce yourself, um, what it, who, who are you, your role in Oxford's Library of Things and perhaps your previous work? 
Uh, okay, my name is Morris Herson. I, I call myself project coordinator for lack of a better term. And uh, I'm one of two co-founders of the Library of Things in Oxford in the, in the UK. Um, my co other co-founder was a, a young woman called Alex who was working in the council waste department here. A friend of hers came across the idea of libraries of things. They started talking about it. I got involved in those discussions and Alex and I ended up gradually turning a lot of words into some actions. Um, and we, or oh, when did we start? I suppose we're coming up to three years since we were sort of actually doing something. And the library has been uh, launched to the public for over two years now. Um, you asked what I did before. What I did before is nothing to do with this at all. I had a completely other life. I've had several other lives and I, uh, I was last working in Oxford University and I was retired from there and I thought I wanted to do something useful with my life. So I also care about waste. I, th I, uh, I think that the more we can do to avoid waste, the better. And I had become involved in sharing quite a lot as well. So the Library of Things idea really fitted for me. So how was the start of the project? And yeah, like how, how did that sort of start? How, how did you come together and um, start actually making this? Um, it's a funny process, really. You know, you, you start talking with people and people get very enthusiastic and you then have to find the people who are actually going to do something apart from go, yay, what a good idea. And um, so there were people around us who were encouraging us and uh, it, a lot of it is coincidence and opportunity. We happened to have the opportunity to find a space in a community hub that was being set up and it's uh, in, in a shared space, fittingly enough. So we found a space in there and that enabled us to start gathering some things, uh, items for the library and uh, work out some systems and so on. So Alex had a full-time job and I was uh, freer to work on some of the systems and try and create an inventory and work out how it would happen. And at a certain point, we we thought we had a plan, what we were going to do next. And so we, we used mailing lists and things that were available to us and we called a public meeting, very grandiose. And uh, 11 other people turned up, which isn't bad. And we had a really good discussion. And at a certain point, they took over from us. So we had a plan and our idea was to involve them in our plan. But they sat there and said, no, 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 that's not a good plan. We've got a better plan. And uh, so we started running with that plan. And a month later, we came back together again. And 10 of the 11 people came back and a couple of other people as well, which I thought was an excellent turnout, really. And about three, four months later, maybe, we, we planned and we had a public launch. So what do you think was the purpose driving you mainly? Um, you can see I'm older than you lot. So I remember when recycling started as an idea. I mean, not obviously exactly, but, you know, over my lifetime, I've seen things become uh, cheaper. More um, people become more wasteful on the whole. And so uh, as a, against that, there's been a, a movement to start recycling. because That's a good thing. You know, it's all right to use resources as long as you recycle them. And I... Think that's a very limited view. I have things on my net. You're watching me in my kitchen, and, I, and on my notice board next to me, there's you know there's things about there's a saying that says forget recycling. It's time to stop buying things, and it's it's that idea that it's a cons that the consumer society has sort of got out of hand. That the idea that you have to have things and renew them and and get rid of things so that you can have new things without thinking about not just what happens to what gets thrown away but also where all that stuff comes from in the first place so you know we, we're working sort of I suppose on a concept of what's known as the circular economy nowadays so the library seemed to me to be a really good idea that you know we all maybe you don't but most of us have things sitting around that you know we've got because we needed them once or because we thought we needed them or because we've been told we needed them 
and they kind of clutter up our space and they clutter up our minds. And getting, getting a project that you can involve people in and that has a practical purpose for people. So, you know, in the longer term, the big picture. So the small picture is have things that people can borrow so they don't need to buy them. In the big, you know, the big picture is change people's behaviour so that after they've borrowed that object that they don't need to have but want to have the use of, they get the idea and the next time they want something, they don't think, oh, which website can I buy that from? But you think, okay, where can I borrow that? And that way reduce consumption, reduce the wastage and make sure that things get used properly in the circular economy chain. So although um, Library of Things have, uh, um, have started several years ago, I feel mm. like it's almost becoming like a global movement of reusing and sharing things. So how do you see this movement scaling up or increasing the awareness of people from um, people around the world? No, it's a good question. I mean, and I agree with you. I think that if we, you know, if we've been having a conversation like this, or if we'd started trying to set up our library 10 years ago, even 15 years ago, when we explained it to people, I think they would have said, what? It's a funny idea. Nowadays, when I explain it, pe people say, what a great idea. I mean, I want to have a T-shirt that says what a great idea, because that's what people say. So there's something in the air, if you like, certainly in my country. And I think it, it exists in other places as well. And I'll tell you why in a second. But there's an understanding that we need to change our behaviour. And I and some of the other libraries that I know are constantly getting requests from people. So yesterday I had an email from somebody in Prague in Czechoslovakia saying, oh, we want to promote this idea. Are we not? I know that there's a couple of libraries already in the Czech Republic, but, you know, tell us more. We want to be more involved. And, you know, I have a list this long of people who've contacted me from around the UK. Argentina, Australia. So my, my vision really is that we could have, you know, we could have a library of things in every, in every town and city. But, so there's lots of different models, but I don't see why by the time you're as old as me, it shouldn't be just normal that, you know, like when you want to borrow, when we want to read a book, you go to a library to borrow it, that people will just borrow things. It'll be normal. Why not? Do you, do you think this will take long or this will ever happen or do you think this is because I think it's a really good idea that everyone would have this library of things like it makes solid sense. Um, when we were in our in the early days there was a um, uh, one of the national newspapers in the UK came and interviewed me and you know did a big double page spread article about the about the library so we got a lot of publicity and the online version I made the mistake of looking at the comments underneath it so never do that it's terrible because it's so depressing because all of the naysayers all of the people who see reasons why it can't work make comments oh people will break things and oh I lent something to my neighbor and it came back destroyed and oh how do you damage manage with them um, assuring quality and oh what about insurance and, and there's lots of difficulties so I think it's a it's it's one of those things that will grow that's what I hope will happen will it happen I don't know you know you have to you have to say yes don't you because that if you start saying no then it doesn't happen I would like to ask, um, have you faced any um, challenges, troubles in spreading the movement that um, the library of things is trying to spread? And if so, do you think it's on the side of the library of things or is it like on the people's mindsets that's rooted in people um, that's hindering them from like sharing, borrowing things? Oh, these, are, these are really difficult questions to know the answers to, aren't they? I mean, I, you know, if you, I feel quite positive and energetic today. You know, I had a good day today. I, I, I've got, there's a street market on a Saturday morning. I talked with people and I got some, bought some nice organic food and, you know, and I've been energetic during the day. I, so I want to give you positive answers uh, to, on, you catch me on another day and I might be less positive. But so there's always going to be, there's going to be reasons why things fail. I only know of one library of things that has failed that I happen to know of a few years ago. 
And I think that was before the movement was taking off more widely. And maybe if they'd been around, been doing it now rather than then, there would have been enough support from, from other people and from the idea getting through that it would have succeeded and continued. I don't know. I'm, I'm surmising that. So um, I think the test will be when we reach the point that we get resistance. So at the moment, people say things like, oh, but, you know, there, there's, there's companies everywhere that will, set, will hire you tools. And you think, yeah, yeah, that's true. They hire them to builders and so on. So, but people who do it themselves, you know, can borrow from us. The time when we meet resistance because we've become big enough and effective enough and widespread enough and got into people's minds enough that they feel threatened, that would be an in indicator of success. We're a long way from that. We're a long way from that. But, but it's, you know, we'll get there. We will get there where people start making choices because they see that we are as big as the big bad world. I think. I hope. Furniture, for example, that's not really something like you share. Um, no. Art. I don't know. Um, tools. Sure. But like what, what kinds of things exactly do you think succeed? We, we talked to another couple of libraries and, and both of them said the same thing, which is you must have a carpet cleaner. So we have, we've got a carpet cleaner. and We've been closed since December and we're opening next Thursday and the carpet cleaner is booked for the next three weeks after that, end to end, because it's springtime. We want to do spring cleaning. So, you know, who needs a carpet cleaner uh, you know um, you don't need it in your of your own you just need to borrow it don't you so so there's there's essential things like that but also you know one of the other things that's been booked is we have um so there's all the terribly useful practical things and then there's the kind of quirky odd things as well and i for me it's important that we have that whole range overall Feeding the plastic that is otherwise wasted back into the loop of our circular economy seems to be the future we are heading towards. Could the library of things be a place to rent those camping gears that you only use once a year? That pasta maker for your Christmas celebration? Or that gazebo for your annual family barbecue? What about the few things that you use on a regular basis? Your weekend fashion, your furniture, your little garden, could they all be upcycled products? One day, maybe there won't be new virgin plastic created anymore, but the same plastic particles that are molded into different forms and used for different purposes. Maybe. Maybe if we have a few daredevils that are courageous enough to start an upcycling business or run a library of things in the city, even though there's risks and uncertainties in how the finance and economics would work out. And maybe if the rest of us can break the stereotypes that reusing and upcycling is expensive, of lower quality, and not cool, we can start by supporting the very daredevils that took the risks for us to make sure all the mankind have a sustainable future free of plastic. So, this concludes our three-part podcast on rethinking solutions to a plastic problem. Remember at the very beginning of our series, we mentioned San Francisco's overly ambitious goal to go zero waste by 2020. Would you still say this is overly ambitious? Or does it seem a little more achievable now that we have talked about all these possible solutions? It is now April of 2021. We have survived the pandemic for one and a half years full of packaging, takeouts, and masks, which may have made you more aware of the problem of plastic waste. Or were you already environmentally conscious enough to reduce your plastic waste generation? Now, Knowing that you can take ownership to recycle better, that you can do more to separate your waste better, and that you can reuse your products and better support innovative business than upcycle plastics. Pella, Naomi, and I believe that a plastic-free future is soon to come. Thank you again, and until next time. That's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, you can leave us a review in the comment section. If you have any questions or thoughts about the episode, you can shoot us an email to the addresses linked in the description. Thank you and bye.